I'm going to start by reading uh, today's scripture. Uh, It will be Acts chapter 16, verses 13 to 34. And uh, would you please rise for the, the reading of God's word? Acts 16, 13 through 34. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed Then he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. All right, thank you for uh, inspiring these words uh, and uh, uh, the hand that wrote them down um, and the hands that have preserved them uh, through all this time. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will uh, be with us today. Uh, Open the eyes of our hearts so that we may see uh, what you want to show us through these words. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as uh, Phil mentioned, uh, my name is Elliot, and uh, occasionally I get to uh, preach here at BCC. It's been a little while. Uh, uh, January was the last time that I, I gave a sermon, and uh, I was uh, sitting here on a stool and uh, looking into a teleprompter, and there were about 10 people in the in the sanctuary, so it's been <laughs> been uh, it's quite a change from from the last time that that I gave a, a sermon. So good to see you all. So we are in a series on the book of Acts, and today we're going to look at three conversion narratives in Acts chapter 16. And I really enjoy reading conversion narratives. Um, they have been important throughout uh, Christian history because they remind us uh, of the many different ways uh, that God can, can work in people's lives to, to bring them to him. Uh, I think beginning with uh, the Apostle Paul, who was the great terrorizer of, of early Christians, uh, to uh, St. Augustine, who was a brilliant uh, scholar and rhetorician uh, who uh, struggled with sexual sin and who um, famously prayed, uh, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. Uh, he, it was in the middle of his struggles. Um, and then in modern times, there was uh, Chuck Colson uh, in the 70s, who uh, many of you may bef- be familiar with his story. He was uh, President Nixon's uh, hatchet man. Uh, and then there was another Chuck, Chuck Norris, 
uh, who's uh, st uh, still a, a well-known action star, and um, Jane Fonda, Mr. T, uh, real luminaries, I think, of, of the faith, who uh, uh, their conversion narratives are, are, are fascinating to me, um, fascinating how, how uh, God can get a hold of anyone's, uh, anyone's heart. Uh, so by way of background, uh, last week, Phil spoke from Acts chapter 13 about uh, Paul and his co-worker Barnabas, uh, who were in Pisidian Antioch, which was a place in uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, there, Paul and Barnabas uh, turned away from primarily preaching uh, to Jews on their missionary journeys to reaching out to Gentiles as well, because they had been rejected in that town. Uh, and this was a big shift in the early church, uh, the way that they saw missions uh, reaching out to, um, to people. Uh, and the terms of uh, Gentile inclusion had to be talked about and argued about uh, in the early church. Uh, so in uh, Acts chapter 15, uh, there was a, a council in Jerusalem where they discussed the, the question of uh, whether Gentiles had to be circumcised and, and obey the law of Moses, uh, essentially whether they had to uh, become Jews in order to, to follow Jesus. Um, and then at this Jerusalem council in Acts 15, uh, the early Christians decided that the Gentiles did not have to, to become uh, Jewish in order to follow Jesus. So in Acts 16, uh, where we are now, Paul is back out on the road. Uh, he and Barnabas have, have parted ways, and uh, Paul now is traveling with uh, Silas and Timothy. And uh, he and his co-workers have now crossed over into Macedonia, which is the, the northern part of modern-day Greece, and it is a primarily Gentile area. And they stop in Philippi, which is a major city there. And there, uh, Luke, who uh, we think was also uh, accompanying uh, Paul at this time, because uh, he uses the word we uh, uh, at this point, uh, Luke tells us about three people who hear the good news about Jesus. And these three people show us that, as with Paul himself, the gospel has the power to reach people wherever they are, whoever they are, and change them. And these three, three people are Lydia, uh, a young slave girl, and a jailer. And they could not be more different in the eyes of the world uh, in terms of their backgrounds, but I'm going to take uh, a look at each of them in turn uh, to look at how the gospel reached them and, and what we can learn about how Jesus uh, comes to people and changes lives. Uh, so first, uh, in verses 13 through 15, uh, we can put them up on the, on the screen to, to refer to. So uh, when Paul and his co-workers get to the city of Philippi, they go to the river. And uh, a city in the, the ancient world uh, re required 10 Jewish men to, uh, to have a synagogue. And Philippi uh, was such a heavily Gentile area that uh, uh, they didn't even have that. So uh, Paul, knowing this, um, went to uh, the river uh, because... Uh, people would have meetings uh, close to a body of water. So Paul knew where to go. And so there he and his co-workers encounter Lydia, who is a, a, a successful businesswoman. And we know this uh, because she is a dealer in purple cloth, uh, which is very expensive. Um, she was also from Thyatira, which was across the Aegean Sea from where Philippi was. Uh, so she was uh, cosmopolitan, a traveler, uh, far from, uh, from where she was born. Uh, and she was a, a, a non-Jewish person, a Gentile, who worshipped the God of the Jews. Uh, today we might uh, call her a, a spiritual seeker. She was successful. Uh, she owned her own business, but she wanted more out of her life uh, and was looking for, for answers uh, on how to live, uh, what the good life looked at, uh, or looked like, and how to be saved. And the good news of Jesus spoke to her. And the way that it spoke to her was um, that it reached her as a, a moral person. Um, the gospel is able to, to reach moral, religious um, people who are, are seeking for, for the good life. And Paul appeals to her through rational discourse. He had a message that he preached 
to people in synagogues, and that was that Jesus was the fulfillment of the hopes of Israel. Uh, Jesus triumphed over evil and death by sacrificing himself on the cross, and trusting in him is the way that we can have our sins forgiven and have a right relationship with God. Uh, He spoke, uh, uh, Paul, when he was in synagogues, uh, spoke to people who knew the story of Israel, uh, and he could appeal to them as uh, people who knew, uh, for example, uh, King David was the greatest king in Israel's history, and he could uh, point to Jesus as a greater king. So that's the way that, uh, that Paul appeals to, to Lydia as a, a moral person, uh, as somebody who is, who is trying to be good. Um, he says it's, it's a good impulse to try to be good, uh, to try to be right with God, but the way in order to be right with God is to, uh, to trust in him and to uh, stop trying to uh, justify yourself, uh, try to be good enough, um, because that is a, a never-ending uh, treadmill of, of uh, trying to be good enough and never quite knowing that, uh, that Jesus is, or, or that you're able to be, to be good enough. And even in our own time, there are people who uh, could be classified as uh, good people, moral people, uh, spiritual seekers, uh, people who are pursuing goodness. Uh, and they, they want to be good people, um, and they do it by uh, donating to the right causes and uh, voting for the right candidates and um, uh, arranging their, their lives in, in good ways, uh, comparing themselves to other people and seeing how they measure up and trying to be just a little bit better. Uh, and they're looking for uh, their good works and their good lives to, uh, to justify them, to tell them that they are, are good enough. But uh, the way to uh, approach them... Um, with the gospel is, is the way that Paul did, is to uh, give them the, the good news that, that striving to be a good person isn't enough, uh, that we need forgiveness. Uh, and we need to see Jesus' death and resurrection as uh, good news for us. Uh, the good news that God loves us and accepts us and is able to uh, unite us to Jesus so that we share in his goodness. And this comes to the, the moral person, uh, the striving person, the person who uh, knows what is good and wants to be better uh, as a relief from the endless cycle of, of trying to, to be good enough uh, and trying to, to look good, uh, but failing and uh, struggling with, with shame of not, the shame of not uh, measuring up. So that is, that is the first person who is reached with the gospel in Philippi, is uh, the moral good person. But the gospel is able to reach other people as well. And then in verse 16, we meet a, uh, a young slave girl. So the English uh, translation says that this, this young slave girl who followed Paul and his co-workers around says that she had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Um, but literally, it, it, uh, it says that she had a python spirit. Uh, and you uh, can't fault the translators for, for going with something that, that's a little bit more explanatory, because uh, if we were to come across this in an English trans- translation, uh, we would not know what uh, python spirit was. But this is a uh, reference to a huge snake that, according to legend, uh, used to guard the oracle at Delphi in Greece. Uh, the oracle was a place where people would go to have their, their future foretold so that uh, if someone was able to tell the future, they would say uh, that that person has a python spirit. They have the spirit of this python that, uh, that, that guards this, this place where people uh, can get their, their future foretold. And this uh, particular spirit was hostile toward Jesus and toward Paul and his co-workers, though, So it led the girl to follow Paul and his companions around uh, and annoy them. And eventually, after several days of this, uh, Paul has had enough, and uh, he commands the evil spirit that was tormenting her to come out. So the gospel reaches her in a different way than it reached Lydia through 
confronting what was holding her captive. And in this way, the gospel can reach uh, oppressed people, I would say. So first, it can reach moral people. Now, it can reach uh, oppressed people. So the slave girl is uh, a victim both of spiritual oppression and also, uh, as we read in the text, economic exploitation. She's being oppressed spiritually, and her masters are, are taking advantage of her spiritual bondage by keeping her in physical bondage. A modern-day equivalent of this might be someone who's a, a victim of, of human trafficking. Um, the slave girl uh, is reached with the gospel not through a rational argument. Uh, that wasn't what she needed. Instead, it was an encounter with a power that was greater than the ones that were oppressing her. And today, we need to uh, be aware of the powers that oppress and exploit people and see Jesus as the greater power who is able to free them. It's not enough uh, to say that uh, spiritual bondage is the real problem um, or, that, or that, on the other hand, that social injustice is the real problem. Um, the, the text and the Bible as a whole does not pit them against each other as if, uh, as if they're mutually, mutually exclusive. When this girl is liberated, she's liberated from both her spiritual oppression and from uh, the economic forces that are exploiting her. Jesus has this power to liberate people from both, uh, but we have to want uh, this liberation. And if we are in the position of the, the masters in this, this story, we won't, we won't want liberation. Um, that is, if, if we're benefiting from the exploitation of others. Uh, these, these masters see in, the, in uh, the story that their investment is in danger, and they value that more than they value people. So they have Paul and Silas put in jail. Injustice reigns when uh, people are protecting their assets or their place in the social hierarchy, and they decide that the best way to do this is by keeping others in bondage. For true liberation to take place, instead of simply having the oppressed and oppressors swap places, as happens in uh, so many revolutions throughout history, uh, we have to turn to Jesus as the greater power, the greater master, who is able to liberate from both uh, spiritual oppression and also social injustice. So that is how the gospel can reach uh, oppressed people by uh, being by, by showing Jesus as the greater power uh, who can defeat uh, the powers of both uh, spiritual and social oppression. And then third, the next person that we encounter is the jailer. He is, um, this is in uh, verses 25 through 30. We can put those up. Um, the jailer is probably a retired Roman military. Uh, we can guess this both because uh, Philippi was a, a Roman colony where they encouraged retired military to settle, and also because retired military all, uh, often took on uh, civil service jobs like this one. Uh, unlike the masters of the slave girl, uh, the, Roman, or the Philippian jailer doesn't have anything against Paul and Silas. He's just doing his job. Uh, he's just a, a blue-collar guy. He's not a religious person. Like, like Lydia. He's not an oppressed person who needs to be freed, like the slave girl. He's uh, pretty much indifferent to, to spiritual things. He's not, uh, not looking for anything more in his life. But uh, in his story, we can see how the gospel can also reach indifferent people. So the jailer is a practical man. Um, he may be doesn't care about spiritual things, but he does care about honor. Uh, that is why he decides uh, that he will end his own life when he thinks that the prisoners have escaped. Uh, it's the honorable thing to do, uh, he believes, when you failed in your duty. He knows that uh, if his superiors find out that the, the prisoners have escaped, that they will put him to death. Um, so he, he uh, decides that he will save himself the humiliation of having to, to go through that. But instead of having things play out in this way, uh, he sees that um, the prisoners have not left. 
uh, which is completely unexpected. Uh, in essence, they treated him with honor. Uh, they put his well-being above their own, even after he had put them in the stocks and, um, and tortured them. He saw their joy that they were still able to sing uh, songs to Jesus, even in prison, that their circumstances did not affect um, their ability to find, to find joy in Jesus. Uh, and they were able to repay evil with good because they followed Jesus, the ultimate person who repaid evil with good, who willingly went to the cross and prayed for the forgiveness of those who killed him. The jailer saw what Paul and Silas had. He saw the change that, that uh, Jesus was able to make um, in them. And even though he was not a spiritual seeker at all, uh, he was completely indifferent to, to, um, to spiritual things. Uh, he saw the cha change that Jesus had made in them, and he said, I, I want that. I want that thing that will enable them to uh, treat me with honor, even though uh, I've treated th them with dishonor. And today, this points out the importance of changed lives uh, when it comes to, to preaching the gospel. If we, uh, who claim to be Christians uh, and follow Jesus, uh, if we don't have uh, love and if we don't have joy, uh, people like this, the spiritually indifferent, uh, won't uh, give us the time of day. If we uh, berate people and try to uh, guilt them into becoming Christians, uh, they're not going to want uh, what it is that we have. Uh, they won't see it as, as superior to the way that they are currently living their lives. Um, they'll see that it isn't, it isn't any better uh, than the, what, what they've already got. So the way, to, uh, the way that the gospel comes to indifferent people is through their seeing changed lives, uh, people responding to them in a way that is completely unanticipated. So those are the, the three uh, conversion narratives of, of Acts 16. Um, we see from them that uh, the gospel reached a wide variety of people. So there are uh, just a couple of, uh, of further in implications for us, and then I'll, I'll close. First is that we can have confidence in the gospel. Uh, it's it can be too easy to think that maybe we don't have what it takes to, to preach the good news, um, that maybe somebody who is more uh, talented than us and who, or who is smarter than us or who is not uh, struggling as much as us uh, is required to, to preach the good news. But the gospel in itself is powerful and it is for everybody. It can convince people who are struggling of the reality of love and forgiveness it can free the oppressed. It can capture the attention of the indifferent. Uh, and we don't have to be embarrassed uh, of it or ourselves. Um, we are able to trust that the spirit who works through the gospel uh, is able to work in the hearts of everyone. And then second, um, the second implication for us is that uh, the gospel is the greatest unifying power that there is. Uh, these three people with their different backgrounds were all eventually part of the church in Philippi. Uh, they could worship together in spite of their differences. Um, the gospel is, in fact, I would say the only thing uh, that can keep such different people together without asking them to completely downplay uh, or get rid of their differences. Uh, there's a great quote from John Stott in his uh, commentary on Acts on this passage, uh, where he says, it's wonderful to observe in Philippi both the universal appeal of the gospel, that it could reach such a wide diversity of people, and its unifying effect, that it could bind them together in God's family. Of course, the gospel also divides a community because some reject it, but it unifies those who accept it. We too who live in an area or an era of social disintegration need to exhibit the unifying power of the gospel. It is, uh, more than anything else, the thing that can hold be people together. And this is what you would expect if it is the good news uh, given to us by the, the God who created us. Um, so I'll close with this. Uh, there was a, a prayer that uh, Jewish men would pray in the ancient world. 
And as a Pharisee, uh, Paul, before his conversion, would probably have prayed it uh, as well. It went, uh, thank you, God, that you have not made me a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Um, this was an actual prayer that, uh, that, that Jewish men would pray. But the gospel of Jesus changed Paul uh, from this way of thinking. He came to see that Jesus loved him and died for him and saved him apart from any advantages that he had had or anything that he was able to do on his own. And he was driven uh, to share this good news all around the Mediterranean world with everyone. And when he got to Philippi, in fact, I think this, it's no mistake that uh, Luke draw, drew our attention to these three people. When Paul got to Philippi, he shared the gospel with a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. I love the, the thought that, that God was able to, to change Paul's heart in that way. May God give us the boldness of changed lives today as well. Amen.